Good morning, everybody. Good morning if you're joining us on live stream this morning or if you're in the multi-purpose room. So it's an interesting reminder sometimes. I got a very kind email from a woman who watches from Australia this past week. And she was uh, mentioning something that she found helpful from a sermon a bit ago. And it's just like a good reminder that we're connected to people far and wide. All right, so what Pete was kind enough to not tell you about our road trip was that we got really lost yesterday. He mentioned Florence, South Carolina, if you know it, but we actually weren't in Florence, we were in Darlington, which is a suburb of Florence, if you could say it. Well, anyway, we're driving home, and Dan Yoon, our group's pastor, was with us. So I said, Siri, give us directions home. So like dumb rats in a maze, we just went where Siri said to go. And after about 20 minutes, we're like, we're like, I mean, what? Like, whoa. Like, we're not even in the middle of nowhere. We're like 10 miles on the other side of nowhere. And we're like, we got to check what's going on. So I checked. And I don't know how it happened, but home for Siri was Chapel Hill, North Carolina. <laughs> that was a long time ago. So anyway, uh, we had some laughs. It was a warm day. We had the windows down, and we did listen to, shall we say, a variety of musical tastes. A tree grows on a hill. The soil is poor. The roots are shallow and short and fragile. The sap is thin and watery and lacking. The fruit is meager and dry. The skin is brittle. It falls off the tree long before it's ripe. It doesn't even have seeds in it yet. So there's no more growing or multiplying coming from that fruit. It's not pretty. It's not nutritious. It's not multiplying with seeds. And so that fruit lays on the ground around that tree, that tree that grows on a hill where the soil is poor and the roots are shallow. It's a fear tree. So the Apostle Paul is praying. And he says, I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. So the message version of the Bible, which is written below, is a translation from a Bible scholar named Eugene Peterson. And I often like to read the message as a kind of commentary on the scriptural verses. And so this is the way he writes those verses. So this is my prayer, that your love will flourish and that you will not only love much, but well. Learn to love appropriately. You need to use your head and test your feelings so that your love is sincere and intelligent, not sentimental gush. Live a lover's life, circumspect and exemplary, a life Jesus will be proud of, bountiful in fruits from the soul, making Jesus Christ attractive to all, getting everyone involved in the glory and praise of God. So I don't know about you, but I'm a person who does tend to ask the question why a lot, as in why are we doing this and what is it all about and what's the point? That's been sort of part of my makeup when I was first learning about Christianity, I was full of why and 
what's the point and what sense does it make and probably a little bit of who cares. But it's a reasonable question to ask, at least I think so. And sometimes I think it's just good to step back and sort of look at the big picture again and say, what's the point? What is it that we're doing? And why are we doing this? I think actually a lot of organizations benefit from stepping back and asking those kind of questions. And churches for sure, I think, benefit from time to time, step back and say, what is the point? Why are we doing this? And what in the world is it that we're doing anyway? I think it's a reasonable question for Christians to ask. This whole Christian thing I'm doing, whatever that thing looks like in your life, what's the point? Why am I doing this? And what's it all about? Well, interestingly, the Gospels have an account where a Jewish religious leader came up to Jesus one day, and he had to say it in a more sophisticated way than what in the world is this all about. But essentially, that's what he said to Jesus. He said, what is the sum of all the law and the prophets? And Jesus said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. That's what it's all about. That's why we're doing it. That's the point. So it stands to reason that it's a good question to ask sometimes about, you know, what we're doing in our Christian life. Am I loving God with all my heart and soul and mind and strength? Is that what I'm doing here? And maybe if this is a complete tangent that has nothing to do with that, maybe we should prune a bit or refine our lives and focus a bit. Because apparently loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, Jesus said that's the whole point. It's incredibly relational. This religion we call Christianity, it's so relational. Jesus says the whole point is to love God. That's an incredibly relational statement. He doesn't talk about our behavior, our to-do list. He says the whole point is to love God. And so I ask myself sometimes, is that what I'm doing? When I'm praying, sometimes this lens is now coming to bear on me. I'm praying, is that what I'm doing? Am I loving God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength when I'm praying? And then I get a little bit uncomfortable because I think probably not. I don't think that's the way I would love another person. All I do is go to him and ask him to fix it and solve it. And a lot of times it's only when I've tried to control it myself and it's not working. And our praying is, well, God, I'll give it to you. Maybe you can do a better job with it than I Is that loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength? I'm feeling not. And if our praying is just asking him to fix stuff, solve stuff, give me stuff, do stuff, If we had a relationship like that with another human being, that relationship would like peter out in no time. There's no heart, no love, no life, no vulnerability, no transparency, no intimacy. It's just a bunch of pawing at each other, trying to get stuff from each other. And I'm like, wow, okay. And when we look at what Paul is praying about, there's a big gap. I'm just being honest with you, between what Paul's praying about and what I tend to pray about, and I'm calling that a learning gap for me or a growth gap for me. You know, you learn a lot about a person when you hear them pray. Sometimes if you just hear someone pray just once, and if they're praying honestly, not superficial religious image management praying, but if they're praying honestly, you learn a lot by what you hear come out of them. Even sometimes by how people address God. What is, you know, some people pray and they say, dear Lord Jesus, and then they, you know, that's the way they start their prayer. Some people say, Father in heaven, and then they pray. All of that even gives you just a little glimpse of this life inside of them. You learn a lot about Paul when you get close to what he's praying about. And he's almost always first in his prayer thanking God for people and then praying for their growth in his love and then their maturation. 
But the first domino, whenever there's a string of what he's praying for, it always starts with love. All the other stuff, it doesn't have a sequential order that's proper unless it starts with love. Or it becomes a kind of false fruit if it doesn't start with love. So Paul is praying, and you remember, Paul is an intellectual heavyweight. He was raised in the intellectual circles of the highest proportion and magnitude in his day. He was trained to be a religious leader, a Pharisee, and maybe even the high priest of Israel to move up to that level. This guy was raised as an intellectual. And when we hear him praying, we get windows into his soul. He's almost always praying about love. He's almost always praying that we would know this love of God. I think for most of us, we love the sound of love, but we've experienced it slimly. When we hear about what it means, intellectually we grasp how awesome it would be and we're drawn to it and we want it, but for most of us, we've only experienced it slimly, thinly, marginally, partially. All of us, Pete, me, the people teaching up here, all of us. Most of the time when we're teaching about it, like I am now, we're teaching because we long for it more than we've experienced it fully. And that's what Paul's praying for these people. It's amazing, you know, in a sense, if you could say it, when it comes to this life of faith, like Paul, he's reached a very high level. I arc towards sports analogies a lot. He's like a really accomplished pro. And I feel like a high school athlete watching the pro and seeing the distance between me and him. You know what I love about him? He's completely not a snob. I don't know about you, but I feel like there's nothing that's more repelling to me than a snob. A person who is an expert or has lots of experience or lots of knowledge or lots of insight, who looks down on people who don't have that level of experience or background or insight or whatever it may be, whatever area of life it is, there's like nothing more repulsive than a person who's just a snob. There's often nothing more beautiful than the opposite. A person who is very accomplished and knowledgeable, who's really patient and understanding with an abject beginner. And you know this, right? All these letters in the New Testament where Paul is writing to these Christians, they're abject beginners. They're brand new in all of this. And so here's this expert, and he's praying so tenderly for these beginners. He's like the opposite of a snob, and it's really beautiful. And he's praying, in a sense, for us, that we would know this love, and that we would grow into it, that we would grow out of it, from it, and that it would be the very soil that we grow in and it would be the very air that we breathe. It's beautiful, but when it comes to love, for most of us, even the most fortunate of us, we've experienced it in partialities. And Paul is praying that we would experience it ever more fully. We live in a fallen world, sin-saturated and soaked, with all the accompanying fallout and fears and fragmentations. After sin enters the world, as the Bible tells us, Adam and Eve feel shame and distance and fear. Frederick Beekner, a Christian writer, comments on their life after sin. And he says, when Adam and Eve made love, it was two people making almost love with a person they almost knew. So we've heard of it. Paul wants us to know it, to know it, to experience it and to have it come to its fullness in us. 
And notice he's calling this something much different than pure emotion. This love that he's talking about, of course it has emotion, but it's much more poignant and profound and redemptive and healing and life-giving. And yes, occasionally it's correcting, but that's all part of the love and the profundity and the life-givingness of it. But we're frail, fragile, fearful, fragmented people. We're so afraid of what could happen if we gave ourselves to love this way. Understandably, we're so afraid of being hurt. So most of what we may call love is actually self-interest veiled in valentines. Oswald Chambers says, if what we call love doesn't take us beyond ourselves, it's not really love. If we have the idea that love is characterized as cautious, wise, sensible, shrewd, and never taken to extremes, we've missed the true meaning. This may describe affection and it may bring us a warm feeling, but it is not a true and accurate description of love. Well, why would we do it in a way that's cautious and wise and sensible and shrewd? Because we're afraid of the rejections that come with the exposures of vulnerability. Why would we do it? Because we're human beings. Tim Keller speaks of this in its relational dynamics, and he says, in false love, your aim is to use the other person to fulfill your happiness. Your love is conditional. You give it only as long as the person is affirming you and meeting your needs, and it's non-vulnerable. You hold back so that you can cut your losses if necessary. But in true love, your aim is to spend yourself and use yourself for the happiness of the other because your greatest joy is that person's joy. And we've talked about this before, right? But we're so hungry for love, but we're so fearful of rejection. So what we do is we guard ourselves. We don't enter true vulnerable intimacy, which means the relationship never really develops. And it may happen at superficial levels at best or fall apart at worst. And the love we're so hungry for never develops. And we say, aha, see, I knew I needed to guard myself, but it was the guarding ourselves that kept that love from happening. Paul wants us to know this love of God. It's a different thing. More poignant, deeper, more redemptive, more life-giving, more healing. But our fears influence us right and left in our lives. And I'm pretty sure the longer you live, the more fear takes a place of residency in your vision. And I'll tell you what fear does in our lives. It sucks the life right out of the living. And there's so much of it. There's so much of it in our culture today, which is so ironic because if we're objective, we've never lived in a more prosperous, more secure place ever in human history than our culture. And we're so fearful. So there's an interesting book called The Negativity Effect by John Tierney and Roy Baumeister. And this book has a lot of research about how fear gets distorted in the way we understand it as human beings. The book goes on to talk about how fearful things weigh much more to us than good things. So even though it's subjective, if you could take two things that weighed about the same objectively, a good thing and a bad thing, the fearful thing will actually weigh this to us and the good thing just weighs a little bit. The impact of fear is far more attacking on us than the benefit of goodness. Now, in basic parlance, you've heard this kind of stuff, right? It's the kind of stuff that says, well, you've got to give somebody seven praises for one criticism because criticism weighs so much more and it hits and lands so much harder than praises do, right? It's that kind of idea. Many of us can remember verbatim the words of criticism that somebody said to us many years ago. We can even hear the tone of voice and see the look in their eyes and we can't seem to shake it. It was one comment that one person made years ago. And we've had many, many people say lots of positive things, hundreds of them, but they don't grip us with a positivity the way 
that criticism grips us with a negativity. So that basic thread is what much of the book is about. But what the book is trying to tell you is, tell us is, the fears that you fear are not as fearful as you fear. You have made them weigh so much, but objectively speaking, they don't weigh that much. The chances that they're going to happen are much smaller than you think. They don't say the chances are zero, but they say the chances that they're going to happen are much smaller than the human psyche thinks. So all this stuff that we're so afraid about, and we could list a long list Money, politics, issues, jobs, future, relationships, family members, kids, marriage, on and on the list goes. The odds that that fear is actually going to come true are way smaller than the magnitude by which those fears are sucking the life out of our living. That's what the book is selling us. Interesting to me, they have a section that talks about the word trauma. Okay, now, we know that trauma is real. Trauma is that impact of lasting pain that comes from a certain kind of experience or situation. It's real. But interestingly, there is no such word similarly for a good thing. In other words, we have this word trauma, and we study it, and we understand it. What is trauma? It's that very difficult pain that comes from a difficult situation. Well, then, what is the same idea on the positive side of life? There isn't one. We don't have a word for it because it doesn't work that way because we're so wired on the impact of fear. Life feels much more threatening than it actually is. I know, I know. Some of you are like, yeah, but I'm telling you, life feels much more fearful than it actually is. I know you're going to say, yeah, but you don't know what happened to me. Well, I do know what's happened to a lot of us, and I do know what's happened to me. I'm just saying, Paul is trying to call us out of this life of fear and into this love of God. So try to take a little walk with me for a minute if you can. Two baby boys born pretty much at the same time. And they're raised in the same cultural generalities, different families, different emphases in these families. And they grow and they gain a very different vision of life. These two boys who become men are Saul of Tarsus and Jesus of Nazareth. They were born right about at the same time. We don't have birth certificates to know exactly, but they were very much chronological peers. They were almost just about the same age. Tarsus is about 500 miles north of Nazareth. And so these two boys are growing up, and they become young men, and they both grow up in Jewish families. One is kind of a white-collar, erudite, intellectual Pharisee family. The other is more of a blue-collar boots on the ground, common sense orientation, view of life, family. And you got to wonder, did they run into each other? Did they ever see each other? Because Saul of Tarsus was trained to be the high priest of Israel. He was in Jerusalem. He had to be a bunch. Was he ever in the crowd when Jesus was teaching? And what was he hearing as he interpreted it and listened to it? Well, if you connect the dots, it would appear that what he's hearing is fearful to him. Did Jesus ever hear him teach in the synagogue, hear Saul of Tarsus? We don't know. We don't know if they saw each other, met each other, knew each other. There's a lot of accounts in the Gospels that say Jesus went into the house of a religious leader and there were a number of people there. Was Saul ever one of those guys? We don't know. But we do know about a particular encounter when their lives came together. Saul of Damascus was on an errand to kill Christians. He had been doing so. He had the blood of Christian lives on his hands already, and he was now going to Damascus for more, to kill more Christians. 
And on that road to Damascus, he has this personal encounter with Jesus. We get renderings of it and what happened, but I am certain that a whole lot more happened than simply what we know about what happened. Because from the time Saul, who becomes Paul, meets Jesus real and personal, after that, all he talks about is love. It's like all he talks about. How did that happen? What happened? What did Jesus say? How was this imparted in? Maybe it was just what he saw or experienced. But after that time, all he talks about is love. You see, Saul of Tarsus, he was raised in a religious kingdom of oughts and shoulds. And a lot of people like it because there are rules and clarities. And a lot of rule-following people just want to know, just tell me the rules and the clarities. The problem is we can't ever live up to the rules and the clarities. But that's the essence of that growth of that religion. And then there's Jesus of Nazareth who grows up in this kingdom of accepting and adopting grace. Grace is much riskier. It's much less clear. It risks people, quote, abusing it. The core of grace, of course, is love. Not just emotional love that says yes to everything. A redeeming, life-changing, poignant, powerful, healing love. Until their paths crossed, Saul was living out this fearful kingdom of oughts and shoulds. And Jesus meets him. Jesus, the kingdom of adopting grace. And afterward, all Saul talks about, now Paul, is love. You don't often think about theological heavyweights as loving people. You know, we think of those people as sort of austere and distant. When I was in seminary, I remember having a really powerful experience. I was 25 years old. Elizabeth and I had gone to seminary. We had quit our promising finance careers. We sold everything and started seminary. And by the time I was several months in, in my first year of seminary, I was having a really deep crisis of faith. And it's a longer story, but I'll tell you that I was really struggling with whether this is true and whether I could believe it. Not only was the crisis of faith troubling, but I had sold, we had sold the farm on this. Quite literally bet our lives on it, if you could say it that way. And so I've got all this turmoil in me, and I've got to have my first appointment with my academic advisor. You know how these are, you're just assigned, it's probably alphabetical. Well, lo and behold, my advisor is the most intimidating theology professor on campus. I was actually in his class, whole, a couple hundred people in that class. He didn't know me yet, but I'd been in his class. And he was an intimidating sort of person who seemed kind of aloof and distant. If you wanted a professor who would love on you, you had to go to the pastoral care department professors. You don't go to the theology department professors. Well, my advisor is the head guy of the theology department, the distinguished chair of theology. So I have to go to my appointment with him like 3 o'clock on a November afternoon. I knock on the door. He says, come in. And so I walk in the door and I open the door. And... Um, he, I guess, had my name and the appointment and stuff on his desk. And he's a European guy, and he, he looks up at me from his desk, and he goes, so you're David Dwight, are you? And I said, uh, yes, sir. And he said, uh, well, good afternoon. And I said, um, hi. <laughs> and he said, come in and sit down. Well, he had done a lot of, you know, history, church history, Christian history stuff. And so I have this family member from a long time ago who was a theologian who some people had heard of, and he being this theologian. So I sat down, he looks at me, and he says, are you any relation to Timothy Dwight? And I said, well, yes, sir, but that was a long time ago. And he says, 
If you prove to be half the theologian that Timothy Dwight was, you'll be a great credit to the seminary. And I said, uh, uh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so all of this intimidating theology professor stereotype is playing out perfectly. So I sit down and he says, so how are you? It was like the key that opened the waterworks. I was in a really deep personal crisis. Even talking about it right now, I can feel it. I remember it so well. And I said to him, I don't think I'm so good. And I started crying. And here's what I remember. His entire countenance changed. His eyes turned to a sympathetic kindness. And he said, how about if we go over here and sit? He had a little sitting area in his office, more comfortable seating and so on. And let's talk for a bit. I'm like, okay. So we go sit down and I remember that he sat forward in his chair. And he looked at me and he said, tell me what's troubling you. And I said, I've sold everything to come to seminary and I'm not sure I can believe any of it. For the next hour, he listened, we talked, and he told me a story about a very similar crisis in his own life when he was a PhD student at Yale. I don't remember all the specifics of what he said, but I will never forget his tenderness and his kindness to me in that moment. I often wonder what would have happened if I hadn't had that meeting with him. I think there's a fair chance that Elizabeth and I would have chucked it and gone back to finance careers. You don't often think of the theological guys as loving that way. And after Paul, this theologian extraordinaire, met Jesus, all he ever talked about was love. You know 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind, it doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it's not rude, it's not self-seeking, it always perseveres, it always hopes, and so on. These three remain faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. I can't help but imagine a peer of Paul's growing up saying, Paul said that? Yeah, he's so different now. What happened? I don't know, man, but he is so different now. He met Jesus, personal and real. You know the word religion, the L-I-G part? It comes from the same Latin root word from which we get ligament, to connect one thing to another. So the ligament, of course, connects your bone to your muscle. Religion, in the American English sense then, means to be reconnected. To what? to God. Paul had been profoundly practicing religion as a practitioner. He got reconnected to God. And after that, all he could talk about was love, love, love. February 1997, we had a gathering of people in our home. This was like seven months before the very earliest launch gatherings of Hope Church. And we had like six people in our living room. We started talking about what do we want to name this church that we're dreaming about? And you know, a whiteboard session to be any good, you have to cover the sublime to the ridiculous and everything in between. So we've got these easels and we got all these church idea names up there. And then somebody says, well, what is this whole thing all about? And somebody says, it's all about love. And then somebody says, well, let's call it Love Church. And then we're like, no, that's so creepy and culty. <laughs> but you know, there's a lot about naming it accurately. Like, just call it what it is. I know, I know, I know, we all know, but you just cannot call it Love Church. It's way too creepy. So, we've all got fruit on our branches. Sometimes, you know, if you, if you see like a, a Christmas tree or something. The ones that are artificial that are really well done, sometimes you can't really tell. You gotta get really close to them. You gotta feel them and pull on them and see if they're real. Sometimes the fruit that we see, you can't really tell, is it real, is it not real? And, and we've got fruit on our branches. But for many of us, we have yet to come into this personal living reality with Jesus. And the fruit 
It's taped on. And we've taped it on our branches. And it takes so much work to keep putting fresh tape on, to keep it taped on, to keep it from falling off. It's an exhausting dirge of habits. And sometimes we ask ourselves, what's the point? I keep taping this fruit on my branches. What is fruit on a tree? I mean, the real fruit, what is it? It's beautiful for sure. Real fruit provides nourishment and real fruit has the seeds in it that multiply and create more of those trees. But you can't always tell by the appearance. A lot of us have taped on fruit that's grown where the soil is poor and the roots are shallow and the sap is thin. It's a fear tree and the fruit is taped on and we keep working and keep working to tape it on. It's a lot of work to keep taping our fruit on. But this love, this this God-given love in Christ, once discovered and grown into, the threats and fears of all the years are stripped of their life-stealing terrors, and life begins. The hiding and the heartbreak come to love, and the ice melts, and the wounds slowly mend, and the green spring begins in the heart. It's not always easy to tell with fruit if it's, if it's real or if it's... if it's real or not. And Paul's praying for them and us that the fruit would be so real because the love of God through an honest encounter with Jesus is so real. What's it all about, Lord? Jesus, you said it. Love the Lord your God. Lord, here we all are, frail and fearful and fragmented. Lord, you know us better than we know ourselves. Would you do something essential in us, something real in us, something that is life-giving, with the real fruit of your love and not the taped on plastic kind. Would you work in our lives, Father? You know us. It's a broad range of us here and where we are in our life and our thoughts and feelings and religious questions. You know it. Would you work in our lives and do something essential? We pray, Lord. Please do it. Amen. Let's now stand and join our voices together once again.